Let's um, get started. So in the last class, in the last two classes, um, all we've been learning to do is how to fit a line to a cloud of points. So essentially the picture that I'm showing you there on the slides. And we've learned to do it two ways. Um, we can either formulate a cost, which I mentioned that you should think of a cost as some, um, some penalty like energy. In this case, the energy of some springs. And the optimal solution is a stable solution. So in that sense, an algorithm that finds you a solution is the same as following the dynamics of a natural system, in this case, a system of springs, and finding a configuration of minimum energy. And in fact, um, to physicists, physicists don't talk about algorithms, they talk about dynamics. Uh, because you could think of what's going on in your brain as just some natural dynamics, um, which you could model in classical mathematics with uh, you know, a large system of differential equations and so on. Um, <laughs> such approach uh, is, has been pursued, in fact. It's often very hard to get that um, to work. Um, um, but dynamics of a system and algorithms are, in a way, the same sort of thing. Nature is just running mass of algorithms around us all the time, and we're, we're immersed in such algorithms. The second way to analyze uh, the problem of learning, and, and this, by the way, does sound very grand. I'm talking about, like in the last class, about imagining and hopes and regrets and nature and dynamics and learning and these great uh, concepts of, con of uh, cognition. Uh, haven't mentioned consciousness yet, but it will come. And then at the same time, all I'm teaching you is how to fit a line to a set of points. Um, but just be patient, because these principles will guide the type of models that we will build. And if we learn how to do our basic linear algebra, our basic calculus for these, these simple models, I'm just making sure that we build up so that we're comfortable with the math, and then I'll be able to introduce much more sophisticated models. And the key thing is that when I introduce more sophisticated models, the same principles, the same math, they will all apply. Okay, so getting the principles, which is what this, today's lecture will be all about, turns out to be quite useful. Knowing how to do the linear model is essential um, to understand more complex models. So we could think of it as minimizing these energies or these costs, the, the springs, the blue, the cyan springs. Or we could also, as we saw in the last class, think of it as maximizing the product of, pro of, of a product of Gaussian probabilities in this case. And the product uh, came from the fact that if, if two events are independent, uh, we just multiply their probabilities. Um, in my videos for 340, by the way, I have several lectures at the beginning which are all about an introduction to probability. What's, what is independence? Uh, what are graphical models and so on? So if you're not sort of super familiar with the basic statistics, if you haven't taken a course of statistics before, I, I strongly recommend you just watch those lectures. And, um, and then you'll see the concept of independence is quite obvious. But just basically think something is independent if, if it does not affect something else. Um, now, if two events are independent, then we can uh, factorize uh, the, the probability, the joint probability, which would be the product of all the, which will be the probability of fitting all those points as the product of the individual probabilities. And the individual probabilities in this case are just those green, horizontal green bars. Okay, it's just each point is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. And by each point, I mean the height. The Gaussian is in the height. X is given. There is no uncertainty in X. Someone gives you X, and you have to guess why. So X is observed. But why is where the game is? Why is the uncertain quantity? Um, and then if we just take the negative log of the product of probabilities, we get the sum of the errors. So we get the cost function. So there is this na natural interplay between solving a machine learning problem as minimizing a cost 
and solving a machine learning as maximizing a probability. However, with probabilities, we will be able to do other things that I will come to at the end of this class. Okay, so that's a sort of message. And of course, as we go to higher dimension, it's the same idea. You have a cloud of points here in 3D space, and you're fitting a plane. And in 3D, you need three parameters, because in, to, to determine the exact position of this plane, so imagine that I have two horizontal axes here, height and weight, and then the vertical axis is an unknown variable, whether you will buy candy in my store, for example. And so, so that I can decide whether I should spend time on you when you're in my store. Um, so assuming you have height or whether I should send you an ad in your mail. Um, so if you have those two variables, you're trying to predict the height of this plane. And then to fit this plane to points, you need to deal with this angle. You need to deal with this angle. And you need to lift the plane up and down, the bias term. So three parameters for... Um, in this case. And as you go to higher dimension, well, I, you know, we can't visualize it, but the, the equation remains the same. It's just basically a matrix times a vector. So it's, it's very, sort of very easy and natural. Okay. So, um, and then we actually did the exercise where we took the probability, the joint probability of all the y's, and we took the negative, we took the log, and we maximized it. And we found that the maximum likelihood estimate, um, the likelihood being the probability of the data given the parameters, happens to be the same as the least squares. No surprise. If the cost function is the same as the negative log likelihood, then the answer should be the same. Um, I gave you this exercise, which I still haven't released your homework, but I think I will move this question to your homework so that you can actually once you have a likelihood, you can actually find all the parameters, not just theta, but you can find also the variance of the points. And if you wanted to build a more interesting model to deal with outliers, for example, we would just follow the same recipe. You write the likelihood, you differentiate it, you equate it to zero, and voila, there come the answers. So the procedure is actually quite mechanic once, you, once we know how to write uh, the probabilities. And throughout this course, I will be writing several probabilistic models. And so um, the goal is to learn how to take data and interpret it in a probabilistic way so as to, make, to be able to deal with uncertainty and to be able to make good predictions. Um, speaking of predictions, we also saw that in a frequentist way, um, the equation of the line is just um, given by um, x times theta. Um, recall that we usually, one of the x's is just one, so that that deals with the issue of lifting the plane up and down. Um, so that would include the, this bias here, as well as the slope. And so given a new point, we can predict its height, which is y hat. And, but we also have a, can also say how certain we are about that point because we can use an estimate of a maximum likelihood estimate of sigma. Okay. So, and, and that's very useful and I, as I mentioned to you, it's, it's important sometimes knowing uncertainty is more important than actually knowing what the point is going to be, what the prediction will be. Now, maximum likelihood is part of the frequentist method of learning. And it's not the only method that is part of this idea of, that, of, of this view of learning, which is based on frequency, which is uh, data. Um, there's other approaches, but I will focus on your maximum likelihood for several reasons that I will make soon clear. Okay, so, and again, the, in more abstract terms, for any model, the maximum likelihood estimate is always the, the sum of the probability of the data given the parameters. Uh, whether you have a Gaussian or a T distribution or you have some very complex distribution that is multimodal with neural nets, et cetera, et cetera, as complicated as it could get in this course, um, the abstract formulation of the learning problem is the same. You maximize the probability of the data um, given the parameters. Okay. Now, 
Another model that's another probability model that it comes to be very useful besides Gaussians is the Bernoulli. And the Bernoulli is just a model for binary events. And so we're essentially saying with this that we have a random variable that can be 1 or 0. And the probability of it being 1 is theta. And the probability of it being 0 is 1 minus theta. If I have such a probability distribution, then in the last class we saw that um, I can compute this quantity called the entropy. And the entropy has the shape that is shown by that plot. In particular, for a binary variable, the entropy is the highest when that variable is completely unbiased, when the probability of it being 1 or 0 is 0.5. So the more uncertain you are, the higher the entropy. So entropy is the opposite of information. Okay. So if I have a coin that has got a 50-50 chance of being head or tails, um, you would be very uncertain as to what's going to happen when I flip that coin. But if I have a coin and I tell you that the probability of it being tails is 99% and I flip it, most of you will agree that that coin would probably bet on it being tails. Um, and so your uncertainty is low in that case. In other words, or equivalently, your information is high. Okay, where does, why are we going over this? Um, it will be obvious in the next derivation. And I will go in steps over it. So the maximum likelihood principle, if you have IID data, is equivalent to, let's look at the first equality. The maximum likelihood principle is just equivalent to maximizing the probability of the data given theta. Okay, which is arg max of a theta of the probability of all the data from 1 to n given theta. Um, let's get the symbols right. Arg max is the value of theta that maximizes that probability, is the argument that maximizes. The bar here means given. So we're saying that theta hat is the value of theta that maximizes the probability of x given theta. Okay, so you have a probability. That probability is defined over x. And you might have an unknown pr parameter like the mean of a Gaussian. And then you just keep shifting that mean until the probability of the data is maximized. If we take logs, the location of the maximum doesn't change. And that's why I use arg max instead of max. I'm not looking at the maximum of the function, but the location of the maximum. Okay, if I take lo uh, a log because it's a monotonic function, it's just going to change the shape of the function, but the location of the optimum will remain what it was. So by taking, by taking the log, nothing changes but by nothing I mean the location of the optimum doesn't change that the height will change but the location won't um, the other thing I can do and I do that in the next step is I can subtract from my expression Another a quantity that doesn't depend on theta, okay? Because um, I borrowed this. Because if you have a quadratic function, if I change its height by adding or subtracting something from it, the location of the peak doesn't change. I'm changing the height of the function by adding something to it. But the location of this peak does not change. Thank you. And so I add this quantity. And here theta naught, I remind you, is the true parameter. Theta naught is the absolute truth, the, the, the exact value of theta. 
frequentness learning assumes that there is one um, true theta. Now the next line is quite simple. Um, uh, log of A divided by B is log of A minus log of B. And the next line is a bit hard. In the next line, I'm assuming something that I will teach later in the course, which is the law of large numbers, that if you have an expectation, as the number of data increases to infinite, uh, sorry, if you have a sample average, a sum over the data, as n goes to infinity, that sample average becomes the expectation. We use this all the time. Um, we never, the expectation of x is equal to the integral of x, p of x, dx. But we often, in order to talk about the expectation, we use an approximation of the expectation of x, which is just equal to 1 over n sum over i equal 1 to n of xi. Now we usually use the sample average to approximate the mean. And we use the sample variance to approximate the, the expected uh, variance. Um, to prove that this converges to this as n goes to infinity, um, that involves some probability, but that's essentially what we know as the law of large numbers. If I, flip a co if I have a coin in my pocket, and I keep flipping that coin, that, uh, with that coin being unbiased, as n goes to infinity, the number of heads would be expected to be a half. So I would recover the true expectation. That's essentially what frequentist learning is about. Frequentist learning relies on laws of large numbers. Uh, shouldn't there be a negative? Since you flip from argument to absolute argument, you know. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, so, the question is whether this should be a negative. I've used another trick. Um, I haven't finished parsing that expression. There's, there's other things that I'm doing there. Theta hat in this case is the arg max of minus f of theta, but it is also equal to the arg <coughs> min of f of theta. In other words, the theta that minim minimizes a function is the same as the theta that maximizes the negative of the function. And so, indeed, um, he was sharp and noticed that I had swapped theta naught with theta, but I did that, and that would introduce a minus, but because I also introduced a minimum, that, two mi that minus cancels. I've done another thing, and this is true. So going back to this law of large numbers, the law of large numbers, this is true when xi is simulated from p of x. Okay. I'm going to spend a lot more time later on, but at this stage I'm just going to quote the law of large numbers. And this is going to be the driving principle behind Monte Carlo, which is a technique that we use to do Bayesian inference. And it's also a technique that allows us to do large scale um, computing. Um, because you just, the idea of some, of just using a few samples is that, you know, just in its simplest form, you walk into a wine store or a bottle store or whatever, and you don't look at the label of each bottle of wine. You just sample and go home. And hopefully that strategy is enough that will, you know, allow you to have a merry life and drink good wine. Now, um, so for now, um, let's just accept the fact that there is this thing called the law of large numbers that says sample averages converge to expectations. And so this 
quantity here would converge to this one as n goes to infinity when xi is assumed to be a sample from p of xi given theta naught. Which is analogous to what I've done there with expectations. So I have a sum and if I have my x's coming from that sum I go back um, to the expectation. And essentially one quick way to, to see this is when I have p of x in the equation for the expectation just replace that with a histogram. If you replace with a histogram and a histogram is just for those of you who have seen delta functions, impulse functions, direct functions um, would allow you to map from the expectation to the sum. And if you haven't seen that just wait a few lectures and we will go over this in detail when we introduce Monte Carlo. Um, however the main purpose of this derivation is to get to this quantity here. Um, and why did I say that the data comes from p of x i given theta naught? Actually I'll pose that question to you guys. Why, why do I make that assumption? Because that's the true model theta naught. Exactly. Because the frequentest assumption is that the data came from some true model. There exists a true model that produces the data. Should the i still be there in the last one? Um, no. Good one. I corrected a bunch of typos from last time. I forgot that one. Thank you. Um, now, this quantity here has a name. It's called the KL divergence. I'm not going to go into it, but if you look it up in Wikipedia, you'll see that the KL divergence is a distance, not quite a distance, but sort of a distance, between two distributions. In this case, p of x given theta, which is the thing that I'm estimating, my model. Because you come up with a p of x given theta, and then you maximize it. But the first step was to come up with a likelihood, a p of x given theta. And p of x given theta naught is the true distribution. And so essentially what we're doing is minimizing the distance between the true, maximum likelihood is minimizing the distance between your model and the true distribution of the date. Oh, actually, I know what pen to use for this. White pen. Now, if we have this, Using the properties of logs again, this is equal to the argument of P of X given theta naught times the log of P of X given theta naught DX minus P of X given theta log, uh, so given theta naught, log of P of X given theta DX. Okay. Now, the quantity of each of the first integral, what is it called? The negative entropy. Minus, there's a sign missing there. The negative of the entropy is essentially information. So this is the information in the world. in the model. If the information that is, exists in the world matches the information in my head, I have learned. That's essentially maximum, that's one way to look at the maximum likelihood uh, principle. Maximizing the probability of the data giving you a new model is a question of matching information. The second term actually is not precisely the 
um, entropy, but it's actually a term called across entropy because it has one term that has theta naught, but the log term doesn't have theta naught. It has that x given theta. Later when we do neural networks, we'll see that that's the thing that we need to minimize in order to fit a neural network to build a classifier. And, and indeed, much of learning is about, again, that concept that you imagine. And if what you imagine matches what you see, then you have learned. Unless your brain, again, has some dysfunction. And about all of us have such dysfunctions, by the way. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm just going to now mention some very very quickly, some properties of maximum likelihood. I'm not going to cover these in 540. If you take a statistics course, um, an advanced in a graduate statistics course, a theoretical statistics course, um, they will go over these um, with, say, Alex Bouchard in statistics or Ruben Zamar. Those guys tend to go over these um, uh, results in detail. Here I will just mention them quickly. Um, the maximum likelihood uh, estimator is consistent um, in the sense that uh, probabilistically speaking, and I'll say what I mean by that, um, theta hat always converges to theta naught. Okay. Now, this, this is just another way of writing it. That I'm just putting the notation here, so if you find this notation in a paper, don't be scared. Um, all this means, equivalently, is that the probability of theta hat minus theta naught being greater than a small number alpha goes to zero. For any alpha, no matter how small that alpha is, their difference will go to zero. That's essentially consistency. Consistency means that as you get more data, theta hat will converge to theta naught. Um, moreover, ML. Um, okay, you can use something called the law of large, uh, in addition to the law of large numbers, we can use something called uh, the central limit theorem. And we can show that the difference between theta hat and theta naught is Gaussian. And it's zero mean because they're consistent, so in the limit uh, there's no difference, so the mean is zero. Um, however, there's some variation. <laughs> Okay, so theta hat will oscillate about theta naught. There could be some variation. That variation, because at the end of the day, they, these are theta hat is a statistical quantity, um, which is a function of the data. But that matrix, that variance, um, so for any, uh, there's many other estimators like score matching and so on, but maximum likelihood happens to be the one that has the lowest variance. And you can prove this, theore uh, this result theoretically. There's an excellent book that has all these results that I recommend um, to you guys, all of statistics. If you Google it, it will be the top hit. Um, and that's why people use maximum likelihood, because it, it converges as the n goes to infinity. And out of all the estimators that convert, it's the one that has the lowest variance. So it's, in other words, it's the one that's most efficient. But then the question that is left out by statisticians is the question of computation. We're talking here about statistical efficiency. But to us, people who play with data and computers, um, this idea of that n has to go to infinity should be ringing a warning bell. And as you'll see, we'll be using maximum likelihood. But keep in mind that in some cases, maximum likelihood is not the right thing. And in fact, one can very easily construct many examples where it actually fails. Not only because um, it requires this crazy idea of that you have to see an infinite number of data um, to learn, but it also because uh, often when you formulate the model uh, in this setting, you end up with intractable problems, which are NP hard or sharp P complete, and then, and then we're in trouble. We don't know how to solve them. 
Um, now, finally, to finish this sort of quick frequentist um, view of machine learning, um, an estimator is a function of the data. So your theta hat is a function of the data, where, as I've been saying, the data is just the same as all your data samples. Um, because you see some data and you compute theta hat. So theta hat is a function of the data that you saw. And we've seen so far only one kind of theta hat, which is the mean of this, basically the slope of this line. But as you'll see, this is true for any model. Um, now, there are two quantities that frequentists usually estimate, and these quantities are actually very useful to know. Uh, one is the bias, and the bias is just the difference between the mean of the thetas that you've estimated and theta naught. And by that expectation, I mean that theta hat is the integral of theta <coughs> times the probability of the data given theta naught integrated over the date. So again, if you're sampling data from the true distribution and you were to average all the possible estimators that you could come, that gives you sort of the average estimate. Um, and bias is essentially how far you are on average. So if I were to plot something as n goes to infinity and Let's say that that's something is a straight line. <laughs> that's theta naught. Then theta hat, you can think of theta hat as something that might be doing this. Okay. So it has, it's very, so I can look at the mean I can look at the mean of the theta hats over n over the data um, the difference between the green line and the red line that's the bias which should vanish asymptotically you would want it to vanish asymptotically but then there's also um, this other error component which is due to oscillation and that's a variance term so that's the variance of the cyan estimator with respect to the mean so the oscillation in the blue line what you want is an estimator that both has zero bias and zero variance but designing such estimators is very hard so in practice as we will often trade off these two quantities. Uh, we might design estimators that have very high variance, but that if we take the average, will be spot on. And in fact, that's going to be random for us. The, the machine learning technique that's used to build the Kinect, that's, I don't know, how many of you have seen the Kinect before? Or it's the, you know, it's the number one consumer electronic out there. So if you haven't seen it, go to Future Shop. Uh, or just go to YouTube and watch the videos. But it basically the machine learning technology that it uses is based on this idea. Let's use something that's very high variance, um, small components that are very high variance, but let's average them and then you end up with a very powerful classifier that will essentially, this device, you put it on your TV, it looks at you and it knows exactly what you're doing. So no wires or anything and it, you can immerse yourself in a, in a game. Um, at the other extreme, we might often want to not have variance because you might be designing something that, um, I don't know, an aircraft and you don't want to be gambling on sometimes this aircraft crashes, sometimes it doesn't, but on the average it's pretty good. Um, so there you probably want to rather uh, be robust and accept some sort of control the bias, accept some bias but uh, try to eliminate variance. That's basically the end of the, the frequentist view of um, machine learning. And next we'll see how to
give me one second. So next we will see how this view, a, a different view which is based on um, other type of estimators. I don't, your audio for the videos will not be that great. All right, so back on track. Okay, so now we're going to see that even though we've, a few of you have used least squares before and a lot of people use least squares, that it's very easy to do better than least squares. Uh, using a concept called regularization, and that will lead to a technique called a ridge regression. Um, we will also, I will also like take you away from linear models to nonlinear models in the first step, um, so that you can see that the same math that we use for linear models can naturally be used for nonlinear models. Um, and then we'll start introducing questions, uh, techniques for dealing with when you have many models, which one is the right model? And that's essentially going to be a technical cross-validation. And then we'll talk about a concept called generalization, um, which is, in short, that you would want your algorithms, when in a new setting with new data, to be able to still do a good job. And that's where machine learning has an age over human operators, because humans come up with good solutions for the problem at hand, but often solutions don't scale well. Um, at least when building web companies to other settings. Um, in real life, humans are actually very good at generalizing. Maybe too good sometimes. Okay, so one problem with li the least squares estimate is that it requires you to invert um, a matrix. Okay. So recall this matrix was D by N this one was n by d, so this one is d by n, and this is n by 1, and the vector of parameters is n by 1, sorry, d by 1. There are d unknowns and n equations, essentially. Um, now, the problem with this is that that matrix that is d by d that you're inverting is often poorly conditioned. Because n might be 20 patients, so you have n cases, and d might be 20,000 genes. So you have a matrix that is 20,000 by 20,000, but you've only had 20 data points, so you're in trouble when it comes to inverting that matrix because it's not well conditioned. Some folks in the 70s came up with a good hack, and this is the hack that I think most of us would have come up with, which is let's just add a small element to the diagonal because that stabilizes everything. Okay, so it turns out that that hack is actually very good. And, it, and, and by very good, not only because it stabilizes the problem numerically, but it's also statistically, uh, it's an estimator that dominates um, the maximum likelihood estimator in high dimensions. Um, that hack is actually a solution to what we called a penalized maximum likelihood uh, problem where this quantity here is the penalty or also known as the regularized. In the numerical lingo, uh, it's called a regularizer because it sort of regularizes the problem, it makes it nice. Um, gets rid of these conditioning problems. Um, and you can also think as a penalty because we're adding to the cost an extra term. Now, 
your objective is still to find a theta that minimizes that cost. And for a particular delta square, so this delta square is going to be a, a scalar. And the reason why I'm squaring it is just to emphasize that I want it to be positive. Um, so if we have that a positive number there, say imagine the number 3. Now you have to minimize two things in order to minimize the cost j. You have to make the line fit the point, but you also need to make the theta small. Okay, because the only way you can minimize theta squared is by making theta small. So now we have a, a trade-off between these two um, quantities. To see that this leads to that is a small exercise. So essentially we have the cost function j of theta is just y minus x theta transpose y minus x theta plus delta squared theta transpose theta. So the derivative of j of theta with respect to theta is once again uh, 2 x transpose x theta minus 2 x transpose y plus 2 delta squared times the identity times theta. Okay, this is using the matrix derivative properties that we introduced uh, two classes ago. And if I equate to zero, then I get the desired result, which is x transpose x plus delta squared i times theta is equal to x transpose y. Okay, so it's easy to derive. It's very much similar to what we did uh, for maximum likelihood, the way we derived this theta. <coughs> now, question, so this is going to be better because it's going to be more stable. And as you will see in your first exercise, in your first homework, this will also give you better predictions. The big question is, how do we guess delta squared? And that's going to be um, a topic that we'll have to contend. Okay, what is the sort of geometric view of this? Um, the geometric view of this in 2D, let's say that the vector theta has two components, theta 1 and theta 2, so that theta transpose theta is just equal to theta 1 squared plus theta 2 squared. Now, I will argue, and later when I talk, when we do our lecture on um, constraint optimization, we'll go over this in more detail. But for now, I will argue that if I want to minimize this, and I want to minimize this second term as well, um, that's equivalent to just minimizing the first term and requiring the second term to be small, to be less than some function of delta. You don't need to know what that function t of delta is. You just need to know that um, wanting the two things to be small is the same as saying that I want one to be small provided that the other one is also small. And now if we have something of this form, we essentially are saying that we have theta 1 squ squared plus theta 2 uh, squared. You want it to be less than or equal to some t function and let me square it for, for the fun of it. So in other words, we have equations of circles. So the constraints are circles. So geometrically, I can now plot these. So if I have theta 2 and I have theta 1, these are my circles, and they're circles centered, well, not centered at the origin. Okay, so those are my constraints. 
I also have, and let me use different colors for this actually. I also have the objective function, the maximum likelihood objective function, which is just the first component. And just like I showed you that with two, two thetas this gives you circles, um, if you have a quadratic like this, a little bit of work, and we've already seen this in the last class, will show you that these guys are just ellipses. The contours would be ellipses, because this is such a quadratic function. And so that function might be something like this. Okay. Let's add some more circles. And so on. So now let's ask some questions. This point at the center, <coughs> what is it? It's the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay? Because the maximum likelihood is the theta that minimizes the red function. Therefore, uh, since this is a ball, uh, the maximum has to be the center. Now, if delta is an extremely large number, 10 to the 99, what would you expect the solution to be for theta? Zero. Zero. So this solution here is what I'm going to call the theta ridge and the ridge is what I'm calling this, this solution here. The regularized theta. When delta <laughs> squared goes to infinity, when delta squared is very large. Now when delta squared is zero, what is my answer? Just back to the maximum likelihood. Okay, because if this is zero, this basically means get rid of that term. And we just need to minimize the likelihood. So we have two solutions. For different values, so we know what happens at the extremes, when delta is very large and when delta is very tiny. So the question is what happens in between? What are the solutions? Now, I will argue that the solutions are points at which these two contours are tangential to each other. And since the gradient is always perpendicular to the contour plot, that will be the point when the two gradients are collinear. Why is that true? Because I want to minimize this cost. So if I move over here, Suppose I move to the left or to the right, it doesn't matter which way you move. By moving along the contour, the cost hasn't changed. The, the, the red cost hasn't changed. But my blue cost has increased because uh, I'm moving from this contour to this contour, so I'm, I'm getting an increased cost. So if I move along the red contour, my second term increases while my first term increases. So the optimal thing then would be for me to get back to this point. And, I, and then the same argument applies symmetrically if I were to move away in this direction. The red would increase, the red ball, I'm going up in the red parabola, um, and, and I'm just going around the contour of the blue one. So the optimal point then must be the point at which these two guys are tangential. And for any delta I can apply that argument and the conclusion is that my answer is given by this curve. 
for any delta, my solution will lie on that curve. At this stage, this is just an interesting geometric curiosity. Later we will find out that this geometric curiosity is actually essential in order to select variables. In other words, if you're trying to predict what the, um, whether a patient will survive a cancer treatment or not, and you're trying to figure out which of the 20,000 genes is, uh, uh, is responsible for the patient surviving, then this technique will be, will, this interpretation will be useful for you to identify those genes that are responsible for the patient surviving. And if you can identify those genes, you can go and design all sorts of drugs and improve healthcare. <coughs> now, uh, another thing that's important in this curve is that some thetas will go to zero faster than others because the curve is not necessarily straight but it's sort of bent. And that's a fact that we will exploit later on. We will use this to create a huge model and then we'll introduce these regularizers so that automatically a lot of thetas go to zero. So if you have 20,000 genes and each gene gets scaled by a theta and if most of those thetas go to zero, the only genes that will remain that have a theta, those are the genes that are responsible. And that way you can figure out which genes are correlated with, uh, with the outcome of what happens to the patient. And that's essentially um, for, the, for the data set that you will play with in your homework, which is um, a cancer data set for, um, it's not leukemia, prostate. the prostate cancer. So some guys have already played with that data set you see that some thetas go to zero at a faster rate than others. So you can ignore some of the variables, but you can't ignore them all. Okay. So that's all linear models, but let's move on now to nonlinear models, and we'll see that the ideas for maximum likelihood and rich regression still apply. So when you have a nonlinear model, the easiest way to move on to nonlinear models is to just construct what I call a basis function phi and a basis function could be, in its simplest form, just a polynomial. So you have your data x. We add to it a 1 so that we can shift the curve up and down, like before. But now we also take the data and we square it. And we've created now a vector that has 1, an x, an x squared. And because of that, if you now take, if we now just replace x by phi of x, so we're doing this replacement, we still have something that is linear in theta, so we still have a linear model. Nothing's changed, but a linear model allows you to do nonlinear models as well. That's, I think, the message I'm trying to convey. If you just pre-process the data. So I'm just taking the data, I'm adding this data squared, and now I can fit models that have quadratic trends. So if your data happens to look like a quadratic, you would fit it this way. And what would be the answer? The maximum likelihood answer would just be equal to, again, phi of x transpose phi of x minus 1 phi of x transpose y. Okay, so you just need to know how to form the matrix phi. The game then is just the same game as before. And once again we can introduce the regularizer, the ridge, and we can also find the, re the regularized solution. Is there a difference between, a technical difference between basis function and a kernel function? Next slide. No. Two more slides. Okay. Um, so that was, in, um, that was a very simple 1D example. If you're in 2D and you have two inputs, um, you can either fit, uh, so in this case we have two inputs, x1 and x2, but you can create a linear basis function, um, or you can in 2D also create a quadratic basis function when you have two inputs. So the same concept applies as you go to higher dimensions. Now here's the catch with polynomials to sort of get you ahead. 
The catch is that if I'm missing one term here. So if I wanted to be general, I would also need a cross term x1, x2. Now if I have x1, x2, and x3 in three dimensions, I will need 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, and then I need all the cross terms, of which there are many. I don't know if it's combinatorial. So my space of terms will blow up very quickly. And that's going to be a problem. And that's where poly, why we don't typically in practice just do polynomial regression um, as a way of dealing with nonlinear problems. Nonetheless, it allows you to very easily, and for some cases, actually, this will be enough. And this allows you to very easily see that linear models, uh, the, the math of linear models can still be used to do nonlinear models. Okay. So, just like we did with. Uh, Maximum likelihood, we can also do rich regression, um, where you could imagine that you have a very large polynomial here that is of degree 14. You've chosen to use this. And your basis function is essentially um, the data to all these powers. And so you're trying to minimize this cost function, and you can add to it um, a, a regular Isaac. Now, a polynomial with degree 14, you know, the sort of a polynomial of degree 1 is just a line, the 2 is a parabola, then for 3 you get an inflection, and so as you go to higher powers, this polynomial will be much more flexible. The flexibility increases. Um, and so a question that might arise naturally is, how big should I make my polynomial? You know, how, how wiggly should it be? The higher the number of terms that I'm adding to my basis function, I can keep adding terms to it. But the more terms I add to it, the more wobbly it will be. Instead of us answering the question of how many terms to add, what we will do is we will add a regularizer. Now, by having a regularizer with a sufficiently large delta, we are forcing some of the thetas to go to zero. So when one of these guys, for example, this guy goes to zero, that basically gets rid of the second term of the polynomial. So if we make delta small, we will get a very squiggly function. For a medium delta, we will get something that will make us very happy. And for a very, very large delta, you're back to having something that is not flexible. Okay. But now, just by controlling this regularizer, we're able to find the right complexity for fitting the date. So we might not know that the date is, a, and we never know this in practice, whether the date is necessarily a degree of degree 20 or 15 or 3. And so, by using delta, we will be able to control the model complexity. The question still remains, how do we figure out what delta should be in practice? How do we compute delta? <coughs> now, to answer your question about kernels, um, just like we use polynomials, we could also do the following. We could introduce a set of basis functions. Actually, before you look at the top of the slide, let's look at the example first. I could introduce a set of bases that is essentially the point located at a different place. So uh, essentially a Gaussian, this guy essentially is a red curve, is this red curve here. I could take another Gaussian centered at 2, a Gaussian basis function and put it here. And I could take another Gaussian basis function and center it at 4. And that would be those uh, four, those, sorry, those three bells in red. Now, if I multiply those red curves by a quantity theta in this case, and I add it up, then I can get the green curve. And theta can be positive or negative, so that green curve could go down or up. That's the basis. This is what's called radial, uh, radial basis approximation. 
It's used a lot in computer graphics. It's very popular for, for rendering. Um, and it's used in numerical computation and all sorts of simulation and engineering and so on. Um, sometimes we do the following trick. Since we don't know where to put our bases, because now we have many unknowns, we don't know, so let's generalize this. So the idea is our new feature vector phi now consists of the location of the bases. In our example uh, at the bottom there are three bases, so D is equal to three. <coughs> we chose three means, uh, one, two, and four. So in this case mu two is just equal to two and in this case mu three is equal to four. We chose a scaling parameter to be one, right, because we still had to decide how wide, how fat these Gaussians should be or how thin. And I just chose it to be one. But if I had to solve the learning problem, I would have properly, I would have to figure out what are the mu's, what is lambda, and what is theta. How do we compute